Jesse Trim and the Jones of Justin. Let us receive the key that comes this day, Lord, and ask you to bless the pastors and bring us your message and bless us, Lord. We just want to thank you for everything and all of your many blessings and everything that you do for us each and every day, Lord. And we just want to bless you all of our Lord and bless us, Lord. In the name of Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We've been talking about going to heaven. How does God feel about us? How do we feel about God? The Bible said that thou shalt confess with thy mouth and shalt believe in thine heart. He goes on to say you will be saved. So what does God say about the heart then? Now the word heart is used in the Bible probably over 900 times. So it it must be important to God then, you know, because my name, you know, how many times your name in there? <coughs> my name's not in there 900 times, but I can assure you of that. But the word heart is, you know, our modern medicine has achieved a lot of stuff here recently. Matter of fact, they've had a few heart transplants, and people were still living. And people that have a bad heart, they think, well, you know, I might get to live a bit longer if I get a heart transplant. The first heart transplant was in December of 1967. You know, they thought that was one of the greatest things that ever happened, but did this man live? What happened to him? But God's been in the business of heart transplants for a whole lot of years. A whole lot more than men. Go to Ezekiel with me, please. Chapter 36. Consider what Ezekiel has to say. By the Spirit of God now. He's preparing these people for what's going to happen. That's another thing we need to realize. When we get to chapter 38, God's letting the world know that he's God. Chapter 36, verse 26. He says, A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you, and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you shall keep my judgments and do them. And so God has performed a lot of heart surgeries, so to speak, over the years. But is it the same kind of heart that we're thinking about today? If you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, what well, is that thing that pumped blood? Is that what he's talking about? Hmm? That's not what he's talking about, is it? And But he says a new spirit as well. So he's co-joining co the heart like with the spirit. I'm going to have this, your heart be like your spirit. Or is it our soul? You see, there's some things about when we read the Bible, we can't understand everything that God's trying to tell us because we are so dense, maybe, you know, that we can't understand the things of God. In 1 Corinthians, turn over there, please. Uh, chapter 2 of 1 Corinthians, I just happened. Uh, verse 9, chapter 2. <laughs> He says, as it is written, I have not seen, nor ear heard, nor has it entered into what? Into the heart of man. Whoa! That same word heart is used there by God. It hasn't even entered into the heart of man to think that God has prepared for them that what? Love him. Love him. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy might. And what did Jesus say about that? This is the first and the greatest commandment. And the second is like unto the first one, he said in Matthew chapter 22. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. But verse 10 says that God has revealed it to us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yea, the deep things of God. Now verse 11, read. For what man knows the things of a man, save the Spirit of man which is in him? Even so, the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. Now, we have received what? In verse 12. 
not the spirit of what? The world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God, which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom speaks, but what? But which the Holy Ghost teaches. Comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But hold on now, verse 14 says what? But the natural man does not think about that now. Why did he put that in there when he's talking about the heart? He's talking about the heart and the spirit, but the natural man does not receive the things of what? Of the Spirit of God. Of the Spirit of God. Think about that a minute. Everybody that comes to church and says, Lord, Lord, not getting into the kingdom of heaven because their heart has not been <laughs> transplanted by God or made new, changed, ever how you want to look at it. Because we're trying to understand heavenly things and we're earthly. So we're having an awful time with this. How is it that we think that we know so much and yet we can't cure the common cold. <laughs> How is it that we think that we are so smart and we got all these people dying over there in China and somewhere other parts of the world with this new coronavirus? How could we be so smart then? We got to, they say they put people on the moon. They want to go to Mars. I think we got some things to do here on the world first. I think we need to get ready to go to heaven before we get ready to go to Mars. Because some of the people that go to Mars may not be coming back. Some of them rocket ships blow up on the before they ever leave the atmosphere. You know, we use the heart in different ways. We use it as a seat of affection. We speak of loving someone with all of our heart. We use it to speak of zeal encouragement, determination. We want to do something with all of our heart. We use it to speak about the physical body, heart in our bodies. There is a physical heart. It's a central system that pumps the blood through us that keeps us going. It weighs about maybe around three quarters of a pound. And it's probably one of the most difficult jobs in the body. Because when you have a car break down, why does it break down? Because there's so many moving parts in it that are prone to fail. Now look at the moving parts in the heart that is prone to fail. If you hold out your hand and like that, and squeeze it real hard and let it go, and keep doing it, that's what your heart is doing. Imagine your heart doing this 70 times a minute. When they're sitting up there checking your blood pressure and all that, what is your heart doing? You see, it moves a stream of blood through your body. It beats about 4,300 times a minute. That comes out to about 100,000 times a day. Or if you're keeping track, about 40 million times a year. What makes this heart beat? What makes it pump? What makes it do what it's doing? Are you doing your hand or your fist like that? Is this not something that the Holy Spirit is doing inside of each one of us? What's causing you to breathe? Are you remembering to breathe? The breath that you take? No matter where you're at with God, his Holy Spirit is still causing this to happen. Your heart is continuing to beat. Your lungs are going in and out, and you're not doing a thing about it. And yet you think you know so much. How is it that someone else is controlling your whole body if you know so much? You know, the heart is a mighty work of God. And, that's what that, and people don't want to give God credit for it. Oh, I did this, and oh, I did that. You know... When God sends you a, one of his calling cards, you won't forget that. If he shuts that thing down and it's not beating any longer, if it's not beating the way it should be, you get a calling card from God. What about your brother heart? When do you get a calling card from God about it? Isn't it when we're out in sin 
and you know you're doing stuff that ain't right, <coughs> and you've got God's calling for it. But what happens when God is no more calling you? Maybe your heart's still beating, and He's going to let you live the rest of your life, what you have left of it. But where are you going in eternity then? You know? The Bible term for the heart is mentioned 900 times in the Bible. Like I said, you know, so the heart is used by God like the very center of mankind. It's our very center. This is what God's looking at your heart right now. He's not looking at your other one because he's just making that and go. In Acts chapter 8 and verse 21, the Bible says, Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter, for thy heart is not right in the sight of God. Think about that. Now here's one of the apostles speaking by the Holy Spirit, and he's talking to this man here, and this man is, <laughs> he's looking to do some things that ain't right. He said the same thing about Ananias and Sapphira in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 5. We find that Ananias and Sapphira they got a hold of some money, and they said, well, you're going to give the money to the church. But they didn't. They held back part of it. And they ended up dying over their money. You know, what are you doing with God? You can't lie to God, because he sees everything we do. Go, oh, well, Lord, I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do that. But when Peter was talking to Simon the sorcerer here, this man wanted to buy... <laughs> where he could lay hands on someone. He wanted to buy that. He said, your heart ain't right with God. You can't buy a gift of God with money. You can't buy salvation with money. You can't come in here and I'll buy a brand new church and you'll get your way to heaven. It's not going to happen. We tithe because we're Christians. We don't tithe so we can buy our way to heaven. We tithe because this is what God says for us to do. So we can have the church. Where does the church get the money to pay the bills? Through tithing. You can't buy your way to heaven by tithing. You know, there's nothing. People need to look at what they're doing. And we need to do what we do for the right reasons. Don't let your heart be doing something for the wrong reason because God might tell you that you might have tithed all the years in church but your heart wasn't right in the sight of God. And then he says to these people, well, I don't even know you. But they said, Lord, Lord, didn't we do all these works? We, we spent all that money on building your church. We did all this to do for your church, Lord. But your heart wasn't right. You had no relationship with it. You see, it's, it's about having... If you love him, why don't you want to come to church? Why don't you want your life to be changed by him? Why don't you want to let him get you ready for his heaven? <laughs> you say you love me? That's what he says. If you love me, keep my commandments. Isn't that what he said? John chapter 14? No. He says if your heart isn't right with God, was he speaking of a diseased heart? Was he speaking about your heart not operating properly? Well, yeah, but it's not the one that's pumping blood he's talking about, is it? He's talking about your motives, your affections, your desires. They're not according to the will of God. God says, look at David. <laughs> I, I love to compare David when I look at it. God said David was a man after his own heart. David was a murderer. Does that mean God was a murderer? David was an adulterer? Was God an adulterer? What, is that? what did God mean by that? Because David said, when he talked to some people there, he said, you know, your heart wasn't right with me as David, your father's heart was. <laughs> that means he repented. He knew he had done wrong. And he repented. The heart is the center of our personality. It's with the heart we think. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12 tells us, the word of God is quick and powerful 
and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and the joints and the marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts. And what, Marie? And it tends to the heart. And it tends. I was intending to come to church this morning. I was intending to support the church. You know, you you could be intending to do anything, and God knows what your intentions were or were not. I was only going there because I wanted to do this. God knows what your intentions are. Do you really want to do what God wants to do? With your heart to reason. In Mark chapter 2, verse 6, there was a certain of the scribes sitting there and reasoning in their hearts. Why does this man thus speak blasphemy? Verse 7. Who can forgive sins but God only? Now, I see on TV sometimes, they got people going into these confessions, and they got this priest going into one side and the person going into the other side, and they tell the priest all the things that they've done bad, which is none of his business to begin with, but they tell him, he says, okay, your sins are forgiven, but go out and do this or go out and do that. Who can forgive sins but God, the Bible says, so how can this man stand up there and profess that they have been forgiven? How can this be? If no man but God can forgive sins, how can this man do this if he's not blaspheming the word of God? And then the Bible says in Matthew chapter 23, I believe it's verse 9, you don't have to turn there, but it's, it's right in that area there. Call no man father upon this earth, for one is your father, even God. And so how is it that they can go in and call this man father and ask this man to forgive them of their sin? And yet we've got over a billion people across the world following this religion. How can this be? In the Bible, verse 8 of Matthew chapter, Mark chapter 2 says, Immediately, when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they so reasoned within themselves, he said to them, Why reason you these things in your hearts? <laughs> How will Somebody got a reason, hey, but why did I go into that priest and ask him to forgive me of sin? Because I don't want to do the right thing with God? Or I want someone to tickle my ears? Or I want to hear a lie? What is it that I'm looking for? Because I don't want to do what he says to do. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth and shalt believe in thine heart, that's all. You don't have to jump through hoops. You don't have to confess to some man. You can talk to him. You don't have to come to me and I can't save you. I, I can't even save myself. The Bible says in Romans chapter 10 and verse 9, If thou shalt confess with thy mouth and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart, verse 10, with the heart, no, with the mouth. Isn't that what it says, Marie? For with the heart man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made into with the heart you confess righteousness. How can you confess something that is not in you? You may have been the worst person that ever was. But when God plants a new one inside of you, you have been changed. You are brand new. You have been changed. Oh, you still may mess up and do something. Yeah, you may make a mess of your life. But your heart's been changed, and you know you've been changed. And you know there's been a change. And, and uh, people can see it in you. And you can see it in yourself. And Matthew chapter 13, Jesus has been given us the parable of the seed sower here in chapter 13. When we get up to verse 15, he says, This people's heart is waxed gross. And their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed, lest at any time they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and should understand with their heart, 
and should be converted, and I should heal them. You see, when he says that God sent his word and healed us, Everybody thinks, oh man, I've got this wrong with me and that wrong with me. His word came down miraculously. I didn't have nothing to do with it, but I'm healed. This is what he's talking about. He changed us. He healed that stony heart that we had. He gave us a new heart. For with the heart man believes that, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in the heart that God has raised him from the dead, and thou shalt be saved. It's with the heart we believe. The heart has emotions. Matthew chapter 22. They came this rich well to Jesus. Verse 36, please. What is the greatest commandment in the law, he says. He asked him. Now, is it the rich young lawyer who come to Jesus? What's the greatest commandment? Shouldn't all of them be good? Is it equal? Which one is better than the other, he wants to know? Who would ask God a question like that? He does. What does he say, Marie? Jesus said to him, That's how love the God, uh, love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment? Yes. Then what does he say? And the second is like to do it. That's not Love and labor as The heart wills and the heart purposes for it determines. You know, and uh, you said the uh, keyboard wasn't working and I just did it. It was working. <laughs> and it was working up here for me before, too. So yeah, well, it was working at first for me and now we try to make it work anyway. In 2 Corinthians chapter 2, or chapter 9 and verse 7, 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 7, Paul's writing again, and here he's talking about what people do with their money, and it's out of their heart about what they do with their money. <laughs> he said, every man according as he has purpose in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. So everything that we do is within our heart. So where's someone's heart if they don't want to support God's house. Where's their heart at? Is it with themselves? Or where's it at? Why do people fall away from church and, and they don't, they're going to blame it on the pastor. Oh, the pastor did this and he did that and he, he built, he, he singled me out in front of the whole church and he said this and he said that. Why would someone get that in their heart to say that? Is it not because they have no relationship with God? Or a bad relationship with God? And so, it's not about money. It's about what's in your heart. If all you've got on your mind is your money, where's God at in your life? Think about that. I don't care if you give nothing. You don't make no difference to me. I don't need your money. I live off of what I should. My, my own. I don't need anything for this church. And if you don't want to support it, I don't care. It ain't hurt me one bit. It's your heart that God's looking at. Do you love your money more than you love Him? You know, it's between you and God what you do. Not me. You can let God know where your heart is. Simple, isn't it? When He separates you from your money, you know where you're at, and don't you? You love your money more than you love God. You know, your heart has to be right with God. You can come to church for any kind of reason you want to come. It's irrelevant to me. But if your heart is not right with God, you're not getting to Him. You know, you come here because you like to sit there for an hour and look at my beautiful face up here, I guess. <laughs> I think you're coming for the wrong reason if that's what's on your mind. <laughs> you know what? In Psalms 139, the Bible says in verse 23, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. 
and see if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. When God searches your heart, and you get to a point and you get mad because somebody said something about money while you were in church. When God is searching your heart, do you have a block there? Because, okay, you can say anything you want to say, Pastor, but don't mention money. Because that's just going to make me mad. And I'm just, I, I, I just don't want to... There's not anything against me. It is you that have something set up inside of yourself that says, oh, I'm not going to do this and I'm not going to do that. I'm going to do what I want to do. You see, so... If you struggling with that this morning, you know what you're struggling with? Craziness. Because if, if your money is more important to you than God is, then is that what's going to keep you out of heaven? Well, what about if I'm preaching on adultery and somebody gets mad here in the church? Ah, you sent me out in the church. I'm not ever coming back here no more. Well, then... Guess what? That person's adultery means more to them than God does, doesn't it? What's the difference then if we put money there? Then their money means more to them than God does? Well, what about if a person is stealing and I'm in here preaching? I'm not going around wiping off windows looking in your house to see what you're doing and I can't look into your heart to see what you're doing. I'm up here preaching the word that God gives me to preach. And if it touches you, and if you fits, hey, I got these steel toes up here, they're still sitting here. Been sitting here for 12 years now. <laughs> okay, if I step on your toes, come up with the boots on. Shake it off and do something about it. I don't care if you never give a nickel to this church. I don't care if you've got a hundred women out there that you're doing with or men or whatever it is. It's your business, not mine. It's your sin, not mine. It's between you and God, not between you and me. We need to get that straight. I'm here to preach the Word of God. I'm not here to judge you. I'm here only to tell you what thus says the Lord is. Then you do with it whatever you want. Don't get mad at me because I said something about money. And don't get mad at me because I said something about adultery or whatever. <laughs> if it's your sin, you deal with it. I don't have to deal with it. I've got my own to deal with. I'm not here to be a bad guy. I'm not here to be whatever. I'm here to preach the Word of God. You know, why do we need a new heart? Because the heart is evil or it's full of evil? We're rebellious. And don't tell me that people aren't prone to every kind of sin. Covetous, hateful, just like that little dog we got at home. I, I buy these little bags of treats. They're a dollar for a bag of them, right? And the Lord, they, every time she goes to the bathroom outside, she comes walking back in, sits in front of me and stares me down because she wants a treat. So we give her a treat. Do you think God ought to give us treats because we do what he says to do? <laughs> if that's the case, I'll buy some people treats then. And every time you do that, I'll start flipping them out. Here, Mark, catch one. You know, whoever's out there, catch you a treat then. Because you, oh, you went out and it? Oh, okay, here's your treat. Come on. God doesn't do stuff that way, does he? And I'm glad because I probably... No, I, I just picked this out. I have a pocket full. No, my pockets that have holes in them. Because <laughs> I'd probably lose them all. <laughs> you know, in Jeremiah chapter 17 and verse 9, and that's another thing. I was looking through that thing for Mark, and I have a video where Jeremiah got baptized here at the church, too. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I, was, I was thinking about all the things that happened in Jeremiah's life. Now, not the Jeremiah here in the Bible, but the, this Jeremiah that came to church and where he's at now and the things that's happened because he turned away from God. Yeah, and we have known him a long time. Yeah, he turned away from God. He went back and followed him no more. Look at the people that have left the church 
They had no good pastor they got out there. That's why they didn't come to church no more. Then you go to somewhere else, another church. But they left this church because they had no good pastor out there. Verse 9 in Jeremiah chapter 17 says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Think about your heart this morning. You thought you was a pretty good person. But you might have a diseased heart. Your inner most being, the real you, your, your personality, whatever you want to call it, the, whatever the center of your being is. And this is why we all, all of us, all of us need a new heart. We need that heart that God has to perform surgery on us, so to speak. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 12. Another verse about the heart that Jesus is talking to the people. And I don't know, if some of y'all had Jesus in here today preaching, you'd probably get up and leave. Because he, I guarantee you Jesus would step on some people's toes. There's no if and but about it. Matthew chapter 23, we read a couple weeks ago. But right now, go to Matthew 12, verse 34. But he called out the scribes and the Pharisees over and over in Matthew chapter 23, about seven times. Scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites. Over and over and over. Finally, we get to verse 33 of Matthew chapter 23. He said, how are you going to escape going to hell? You generation of vipers. And now he says what in verse 34, Marie? Oh, generation of vipers, how can you, being evil, speak this thing? For out of the of the heart, the mouth speaks. <laughs> He's not talking to them now. He's talking to the people listening to him preach. I, if, if, you know what? If I did that today, and we had a church full of people, they'd probably most of them get up and leave. I call them a bunch of snakes. Why is that? Because people don't want to hear the word. The word they want to hear a lie. They want to hear, I'm a pretty good person, you're a good person. They might be living in adultery, they might be robbing God, they ain't, they ain't no telling what they're doing. They could be doing anything they want to do. Pretty good people in hell Yes, that's right. There's going to be a lot of good people in hell. Yeah. There's going to be a lot of Christians in hell, to tell you the truth. Because the word for Christian is, is used so loosely today... It's not real because even some of the Muslims that I have known call, them, call themselves Christians. <laughs> I don't know how you could be a Muslim and a Christian, but some of them have told me, oh, I'm a Christian too. Yeah. In Matthew chapter 15 and verse 19, for out of the heart proceeds evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness. Blasphemies. And so when you have these thoughts that you're having, where are they coming from? Are they coming from you? If they are, they're coming out of your heart. If they're being imposed upon you by the devil, either way, you, you need to do something about it. I'm not taking that, devil. You ain't put that on me. That's not me thinking that. That's you trying to make me think that. <coughs> If it's you, you need to just simply repent. Lord, I'm sorry. I don't know why I'm thinking like that. I wish I wasn't. The people today, if they have a physical heart that is messed up, they need a transplant. Because their heart is diseased and wore out. They volunteer for a new heart transplant. And when they get this new heart transplant, is it going to work? Is it going to keep them alive? Well, if it doesn't, death was imminent anyway, wasn't it? What if we took your heart out? What if we took your heart out and we put it in a glass? A little glass box and it would set it on the table. 
And all the things that was in your heart, people could see. How would you like that? So how would you like that? I would. Because then they could see everything that's in your heart. If it was good or if it was bad or whatever it was. But see, what is God doing? Isn't God just doing just that? He should see everything that's in our heart. What are we going to do about it? God says we have to confess with our mouth and believe in our heart. What are you going to do? It's a, if God puts your heart out on display, would you be willing to let everybody look at it? Or would you want to put something over it, put a cover over it, a rug or something? We all, every one of us, desperately need a new heart. And God offers us a new heart. God told Israel in Ezekiel chapter 36, I read this a while ago, in verse 26, A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. <coughs> and see, this is going to happen right before this major war. This last war that we're going to see, Ezekiel's war, this is what's going to happen. Because God is preparing Israel. They're going to accept him, Jesus, as their Savior. It's written. I'm going to give you a new heart. I'm going to take away that heart of flesh, and I'm going to give you a new heart. And I'm going to cause you to walk in my statues and keep my judgments and do them. He's going to give Israel a heart like he's given us Christians today. Israel is going to become born again. And that seems different from the way it's been because they have rejected Jesus all these years. But they're going to have a deep transformation take place. You know, they're going to have something that they never had before. The very thing that we can have this morning. We can be born again. We can get this new heart by being born again. And Titus, I like the way that Paul writes to Titus and he puts it in chapter 3 and verse 5, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of and regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. In John chapter 3, verse 3, Jesus answered and said to him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. You know, then we go to 2 Corinthians. You want to know a good guidepost <coughs> to see if, uh, if you have been born again? Yeah. You know what, I'm not, I'm not here to judge anybody this morning. I can't, if, I, if I point my finger at somebody, i got three more pointing back at me, and sometimes i got to hold that thumb down because it wants a bow back at me too, so that's almost four then. And so, but a good guidepost that I see in the Bible, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, have you been born again? You know, if you look at this verse and, and you compare yourself, are you anything like this verse says? Is anything remotely kind of like this with you. He said, what we read, therefore, if any man is in Christ, he is what? He's a new creature. Yeah, a new creation. Old things are passed away, and all things have become new. Think about that. Are you still that same old snake in the grass, or have you been changed? You see? If, and don't, don't let me put you on a guilt trip this morning, because that's not what I'm here for. I'm here to tell you about getting a new heart. You know? I had to come to a point one time, and still do on a daily basis, probably, that there's some things in my life I've got to quit doing. You know, the Lord, yeah, I see. I made a wreck. I've done some awful things in my life. I've been bad. <laughs> and I mean, I've made a... If anybody ever made new letters for the word bad, I've made them. B-A-D. I don't know. How, if anybody's ever made some... Some bad mistakes in their life, I've made them. So how can I judge anybody when, when I look at my own self? So I can only tell you one thing. If any man is in Christ, all that bad is gone. 
it's gone. He becomes a new creation. And Second Corinthians chapter 6 is one chapter up in verse 16. He asked a question. You know, think about it. Why are you doing some of these things that he asked a question about? Read verse 16 and 17. Then. And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. Only God can give us a clean heart. Only God can change us. You know, if, if we understand what God's Word says, you know, there's no private interpretation of it. Well, I think it was for this over here, or I think it was for that, or... Well, take some of the women preachers today. Turn with me to First Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 2. Now, I've heard people say that women preachers will get up, and it's okay for this woman to preach today, because back in the time that Paul was writing, then people was rowdy and they were doing this, and they had to set up some kind of thing to keep the women from hollering and screaming out in the church. So, that's the reason Paul wrote this in there. And, but see, all scripture is given by inspiration of God, profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, and instruction in righteousness. Okay? So, if we say that God has inspired Paul in one part, then he has to have inspired him in all parts. So, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, please read that, uh, chapter 1, verse 2. Read that verse, Marie. And to the church of God, which is at Corinth. So, who is he writing this letter to? Who is this letter written to? The church of God at Corinth. Yes. Okay, who else? To them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus. Are you sanctified in Christ Jesus? That means saved, set apart. Are you set apart in Christ Jesus? Not are you just in the church at Corinth, but are you set apart? Have you been saved? Have you been saved? This letter's to you. If you're in the church at Corinth, this letter's to you. Who else? All of these things. With all that in every place, call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. And so, if you fit into that category, then this letter is written to you. That means, if you're a woman out here preaching today, and you're talking that this was out here 2,000 years ago because they had a different business than we have today, then you're thinking something else. You're, you're coming up with your own conclusion. You have your own interpretation. This is not what the Word of God says that you're saying. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 34. What does he say here, Marie? Let your women do what? Let your women keep silence in the churches. Why? For it is not permitted unto them to speak. He's talking about preaching women now. But they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. Okay, now let's read verse 37. You're at verse 34, we're going to skip over 35 and 36, because he's talking about the same thing, but go ahead, verse 37. If any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. Now, what, what is God saying? Is, he, is these commandments only for the people in Corinth in the first century? And, and, but yet it's for everybody? Come on, now what's the Bible saying? Do we do what God says to do, or we do what somebody else says to do? Just that simple. Do you need to have someone interpret the Bible to you? Or can you hear, thus saith the Lord? Just that simple. Can you hear what God says? Why does God put this out like this? If we go to 1 Timothy chapter 3, and you read that example in there, he says, but, he gives us an example as Christians how we're supposed to live. Look in verse 7, please. They must have a good report of them that are without, lest they fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. 
And so, how can you have a good report, not only from the people in the church, but out of the church, if the Bible says a person is not supposed to do something, and they're doing it? Can you get a good report? Does it say, too, that you have to be the husband of one wife? To be yes, one? yes, it's all that's in that, that same chapter there. You know, we just need to understand. You either going to do what God says to do, or what someone else tells you. And why would they tell you something? Because they want to have it their way. There is no private interpretation. All scripture is by the inspiration of God. You cannot pick and choose. If it says this, I'm going to tell you what. There's probably, you could probably line up a hundred women at this church right now to preach a whole lot better than I could ever preach. There's no doubt about it. They probably know more than I know. They probably memorized the Bible. They probably did a whole lot of stuff more than I've ever done in my life. But have they been called by God? How can they be? How can they be? What does the Word say? Turn, turn to Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10 and verse 13 says, Whosoever therefore that shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Is that what it says? Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, verse 14. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? <laughs> now, what's the next verse say? And how shall they preach, except they be sent, as it is written? How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. The thing is, you've got to be doing what God says to do. If he says, thou shalt not commit adultery, you say, well, I know I'm not supposed to commit adultery. If he says, thou shalt not steal, I know I shouldn't be stealing. If he says, thou shalt not commit murder, well, I know I shouldn't be killing somebody. But when he says, let your women be silent in the church, and then he has to come back and say, these are commandments of the Lord, and you still want to do it? How can you be doing the will of God? I mean, I'm not, I'm not, you know, I'm not down on women. I thank God for women. I, you know what? And like I said, they probably women do a lot better job of preaching than I could ever do. But he asked them to keep silent because he knows how women like to talk. I'm, I'm, all I'm telling you is what the Word of God says. Now, if God wants to change his mind about it, then God should change his mind. But if he does, then you're going to have to change the Bible. Otherwise, God ain't changed his mind because he knows he's going to have some knucklehead up here like me preaching, and it says what it says, and I'm going to say, oh, no way. How can you take that out and put something else in there? Oh, what do you want me to believe next then? I don't understand why people don't understand what God is saying. Thus saith the Lord. It's not what this person or that person said. It's what God has to say. Whose heaven do you want to go to? This woman's heaven? Or you want to go to God's heaven? There ain't but one heaven, so it ain't a matter of choosing which heaven you want to go to. There ain't but one. You either do it God's way, or you don't. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 says, For by grace are you saved through faith, <coughs> and not of yourself. It's a gift of God. Why? Verse 9 says, Not of works, lest any man should boast. I can preach! That's what they're boasting. I can preach. And they don't like me. Well, they don't like me because of this and because of that. That's not it. I'm not a male chauvinist. If we didn't have some of the women we've had in our church all these years, we wouldn't have a church. Yeah. And look at that covenant God given with the women. I don't have that covenant. He said, let the women wear the veil. Not for me. I can't do it. He tells me I can't pray with my head covered, but the woman has to. So God knows. 
When the angels that are falling look at her, oh, she's an easy target. She's not doing what God said. Oh, you better not mess with her. Look at that veil she got on her head. I don't have that covenant she's got. She's got covenants I never even dreamed of having. <laughs> Whatever. You can do what you want to do, though. If you're, all you have to do is make yourself happy, you can put you a veil on your head if you're a man you want to. But I can only tell you, the sinful heart is uncurably wicked and hopeless. It's going to come up with, if you see someone doing what they're doing, and you know what the Word of God says, then you understand their heart is uncurably wicked. It can't be fixed. It has to be taken out, and a new heart has to be put in its place. Okay, it's just that simple. A person doing against the Word of God, they have not been born again. It's impossible. Because they've still got that old, incurable heart. It can't be improved. You can't patch it up. You can't give it medication. And Lord, don't even know the world tries. Maybe you think you can take that old heart and give it some education and make it walk right and act right and do the right thing. But I gave an example here years ago and made some people mad at me. But I'm going to give you that example today. This woman wanted to make a baby doll. Didn't have no money, but she wanted to make a baby doll. She had some old raggedy clothes. So what she did, she went out into the cow pasture, figured she didn't know what to get to make for the inside of the baby. So she got her up a little cot, a cow pie and rolled it up in a little ball and laid it up in the sun and it hardened up and everything. So she took that home and trimmed it a little bit and fixed it. And then she made some doll baby clothes and put them on it. And found the doll baby head and stuck on the top of this thing she rolled up. And then she found an old broke up doll baby in pieces. And she got that little ma ma thing and put it in her <coughs> mouth. And she would sit there and hold it and cuddle it and talk to it like it was a real baby. You know, and then she lay it down on a pillow in her bedroom, the same pillow that she slept on. She would lay that down on her, her bed pillow that night and she would talk to it and love it and kiss it good night. But what did she have? Underneath all that, what did she have? She had a cow pie. That's what was there. And that's what her heart is like. You can't change it. What it is, it is. If you don't become born again, you've got that same stinky, dirty, smelly, old, yeah, messed up heart. You must be born again. Or Jesus wouldn't have said that to Nicodemus. I tell you the truth, Nicodemus, you have to be born again. Or you cannot get into heaven. Just that it's impossible. You cannot get there. You know, Matthew chapter 15, verse 19 again, where out of the heart proceeded evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornication, thefts, false witnesses, blasphemy. You, see, you can't change. Nothing about you. You can't change yourself. We say, I'm going to make a New Year's resolution. You won't keep it. Well, I'm going to quit smoking. No, you won't. I'm going to quit drinking. No, you won't. Unless the Lord takes it from you. Unless you do it through the Lord. You're not going to do none of it. It's, it's all going to fall apart because you cannot change. God gives you a new heart. You don't want the cigarettes in it. God gives you a new heart. You don't want to drink no more. God gives you a new heart. You don't want to do what God says not to do. You want to do everything that God tells you to do. If he didn't tell you to quit smoking, that ain't on me. If he didn't tell you to quit drinking, that's not on me. It's between you and God. What you do and what you don't do. It's not for me to decide what you do and don't do. Look at the Word of God. Do what God says. That's all. A new life. Be made over. Have a new heart. Be changed. By God. You can't do it on your own. And only God can perform this miracle. If we got anybody in here's heart surgeons? How can you change somebody's heart? Well, I'd give you a scalpel and a, whatever, a razor blade knife or, and a, a pair of scissors and 
some pliers and some bailing wire or something. Then you can switch out hearts with somebody then, huh? If you can't do this, then how do you expect to do this other on your own? You can't do man's heart, how are you going to do God's heart? You know, John chapter 1 verse 11, the Bible says, He came unto His own. <clears throat> I preached this message on at the nursing home a couple of weeks ago. He came unto His own. And I looked around in there and I said, Who was His own? Well, probably some people in West Virginia. I said, yeah, probably. If they're Jewish, you know, who did he come to? He came to the Jewish people, right? But his own received him not. But then he says in verse 12, As many as received him, to them gave he power to do what, Marie? Become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. And up in verse 13 now, read it please. We were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. We have to be born again, but there's nothing that we can do to make it happen. We cannot say, Jesus, come into my heart. That's not going to work. That's not in the Bible. But what is in the Bible? God said he's going to give us a new heart. He's going to do it. It's not something that you can do. Whosoever, therefore, that shall call upon the name of the Lord, you call upon him. Lord, I believe. I believe with all my heart that you are the son of the living God. I believe with all my heart that you can save me. And Lord, I'm just asking you to do that for me right now. We, We are so unworthy. And we have come up with every kind of imaginable thing to prove that we're Christians. Oh, well, I said, Jesus, come into my heart. I said this, and I said, but when did you trust God? When did you trust God with your heart, with your life, with your being? John chapter 3, verse 36 tells us, He that believeth on the Son has everlasting life. And what else does he say, Marie? 3.36 3.36 Has everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. So asking Jesus to come into your heart is not believing on him. It's asking him to do it all. When are you going to believe on him? You see, that's all it's about, believing on him. For with the heart a man believeth unto righteousness, and then with the mouth confession is made to salvation. John chapter 5, verse 24. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word, and believeth on him that hath sent me, has everlasting life, and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. So when do you receive eternal life? When, do you, when are you saved? When are you know that you're on your way to heaven? When you believe on Him. Not when you came up here. Not when you got baptized. Not when you jumped through all these hoops that some church told you to do. It's when you believe upon Jesus. With all your heart. Oh, that's an awful thing for some of the churches today. They're not going to like me for that. Oh, you've got to be baptized. Oh, you've got to do these seven things to be saved. The Bible says, read it, Marie, verse 24. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life, and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Right then, not a hundred years from now when you die, you are your way to heaven today. Right now, the moment you believe on Him, and you put your trust in Him, and you take Him as your Savior, you become born again. Right then and there. If you walk in front of that train, you're going to heaven. But you're already in heaven. You are already a saint. You are already a Christian right then and there. Isaiah 55, where they get Santa Claus and ho, ho, ho from. (laughs) Verse 1. Ho, everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters. 
and he that hath no money, come ye, buy and eat. Yea, come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Wherefore do you spend money for that which is not bread? And you labor for that which satisfies not. Hearken diligently unto me, and eat ye that which is good, and let your soul delight itself in fatness. But we've run out of time now. I want to go back to one, one more few little verses here in Romans chapter 3. Now, he asked the question, what then are we better than they are? When we become born again, when we become children of God, the first thing some people want to do, they want to go out and point their finger at their neighbor and tell their neighbor that they're on their way to hell because they don't go to church. And they're, they're going to be suffering the flames of hell. But Paul tells us in verse 9, are we better than they? No. In no wise. For we have before proved both Jews and Gentiles that they are all under sin. That means no matter who it is, including yourself, we've been under sin. So don't think yourself being so great. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. Verse 23. <laughs> yeah. Right. Jeremiah Black and Hank's eyes for him telling him he was not going to heaven, huh? He was just trying to talk to him. And yeah, Jeremiah asked him what he needed to do to be saved, and Hank told him, you know. And Jeremiah beat him up, blacking his eyes and. Choking. Yeah, knocked holes in the wall of his house. Verse 23 says what? And the uh, Mm hmm. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And not a person is going to stand in front of God and say, I was a good person. I did this, and I got so and so saved, and I did this, and I did that. We have all under sin, and we need to realize that. So we all need a Savior. We all need Jesus this morning. You can think what you want. You know? I can't keep you here all morning. I just want you all to know this morning, if Jesus is in your heart, there's no room for the devil. If Jesus is really in your heart, there's no room for the devil. Oh, the devil may tempt you, but there's not room for him in your heart. Because the, Lord, the Word of God tells us that His Word is going to keep us. His Word is going to constrain us. His Word is going to change us. His word is going to make us into what God wants us to be. If you don't want to hear his word, then you don't want to be changed. You want to stay like you are. Maybe you think, well, I've been being a Christian all these years, but I still got a few things to do. And I agree with you. So do I. I've been walking with God for quite a few years. And I still have some things that God probably wants me to do. And you know what? It's just like that house we bought down there in Sistersville. Every time we look around, we've been in it 20 years now. <laughs> Boy, 12 of them 20 years, I've been out here at this church. I've been driving 27 miles one way out here to this church for the past 12 years, preaching the Word of God. And you know... This old house is still standing that I'm living in over there. This old church is still standing, barely. <laughs> you know, and I'm still standing, barely. But one day, that house that I'm living in is going to be gone. This church is going to be gone. And people, if this world is still here, they'll be drive by here. Maybe there'll be an empty lot. Maybe there won't even be a remembrance that there ever was a church here. But you know what? Those that have accepted Jesus as their Savior, 
Yes, they will be in heaven. A thousand years might pass. A million years may go by, and they still will be in heaven. But where's all these other people going to be? You see, the world's going to come, the world's going to go. But where are you going to be when it's all over? I'm going to be with Jesus. And I'm going to give you an altar call now this morning. If you want to come, I can't save you, but he can. If you'll come here, you get on your knees, and you say, Lord, save me. That's all Peter said. Lord, save me. And Jesus reached out his hand and grabbed him. He saved him. He can save you. If you believe in him, he can save you. First off, you have to believe on him. And then you confess him with your mouth. He is my Savior. I wish you'd make him your Savior too if he isn't. Because it's the only way you're going to get to heaven. Through Jesus Christ. So now we're going to have altar call. Marie's going to give us a song of invitation. I encourage you to come and talk to the Lord this morning. You'll find out that he is here waiting for you. Matter of fact, he'll help you get all the way up here to the altar. Thank you.